Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Lily Ash. Lily is a mental health advocate, storyteller and social entrepreneur. As a teenager, you were considered unsafe to self and admitted to a psychiatric ward. For a long time, you were ashamed of your experience until you opened up and discovered the power of conversation. Having gained experience working with the likes of Fresh Sight and TEDx University of Edinburgh, you've since gone on to found Real Talk, a social enterprise dedicated to mental health storytelling and well-being. Real Talk supports individuals in connecting to their narrative around experiences of mental ill health and crafts safe spaces for these stories to be shared to an audience fostering conversation and connection. Lily, it's wonderful to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It is genuine pleasure. Um, somebody that shares the same passion for conversation as me mm -hmm. can't be a bad thing, right? It's true. Who knows what's going to happen here? It might be. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Transported. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. So, I mean, if we can start with your early life, um, you don't have an Edinburgh accent, so I'd be interested to hear no. where you grew up and, and I suppose what growing up was like for you. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in the United States. I grew up in a place called Greenwich, Connecticut, which is in the Northeast, um, about 45 minutes, 50 minutes outside of New York City. And yeah, growing up was in many ways amazing to be alive, to be to be growing and to live. I lived in really beautiful. I, I live, stroke lived, live mm. in a really beautiful area. It's right on the coast and there's a beautiful beach and nice. um, Grew up in a place called Byram, which is an area of Greenwich, which has some some great people there. Um, equally, it's pretty pretty affluent area. Um, it's actually one of the most affluent places in the United States. So wow. it um, had a lot to offer, but also a lot to lend perspective on. Just seeing um, really extreme examples of things, I think, lent uh, lent a lot of perspective to me as a young person growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely surrounded by really motivated and, and bright people. Um, I think it's hard to encapsulate what it was like growing up and how that's impacted me now, if, if I'm maybe getting a bit ahead of myself. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, overall, yeah. Grew, up, grew up pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then obviously experienced mm. some, um, some difficult moments of sort of my own mental health. Sure. But um, I'm sure we'll kind of get into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been a whole, whole journey in and of itself. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure thing. That's, that's where we're going. Yeah, definitely. Um, what's, what's schooling like in the US? Mm. So, I mean, it's arranged a bit differently than it is here in, in the UK in that we have um, elementary school, middle school and then high school. Um, I went to an elementary school called New Lebanon, which is really small, and so all of our classmates, we knew each other really well. Um, but there is definitely, maybe as it's like here, a lot of focus on achievement of standardized testing and making sure that you're kind of up to snuff with the sort of the, the level that they'd expect or hope for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was in these sort of advanced placement courses. Um, they used to call them TAG, which was talented and gifted, but then people had sort of issue with that because they were like, wait, all children are talented and gifted. Yeah, okay. So then they relabeled it ALP, which is the advanced learning program. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, so that was kind of cool, getting to really delve into certain subjects. Um, but yeah, quite, I don't know, quite traditional. You kind of study your, your set, you know, your, your math and um, your social studies and your science and your English. Yeah. Um, and then as you moved up through the years, elementary school to middle school, you kind of get bigger pools of, of children because the, the various schools then feed into each other. And finally, Greenwich High School was the only public school in my town and it was almost 3,000 kids. So it was pretty big mm. um, and kids from all over, all over town. So that yeah. was pretty, pretty intense. <laughs> you know, high school itself was already such a time of transition and self-definition. And then, you know, you're kind of all these people coming from their different sort of uh, areas and mm -hmm. you're trying to be like, who am I? Who are the people that I, that I know and I get along with? And um, yeah, yeah. how am I going to imagine myself in this space? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what's your earliest memory of having, um, you know, sort of when you talk about mental health, like what, what, did, what did that mean for you? And what's your earliest kind of memory and experience mm. of, of mental ill health, if you want? Wow, I think that's, that's a tricky question because in many 
in many ways, until you're given the language and the labels to define something, when you're going through it, it's, it's looking back that you then can say, oh, maybe that was me experiencing this or thinking this or the beginning of, of, of that. Because mm -hmm. um, when you're young, you're just, you're living and you're thinking and you're like, this just must be how the world is. Yeah, um, yeah. But I do have a very clear memory. It's, it's a weird one of me at my elementary school, probably in third grade, which makes me about nine years old. And they had these two separate playground areas. And one of them was the wood playground. One of them was like the plastic new playground. And I was in the plastic new playground. And I was going down this slide and I get to the bottom and I for some reason think about what it would be like to be dead. And not in a way like actively wanting to die, but I mean, maybe that's, I'm also who's, who's to say that's, that's mental illness or ill health, mm -hmm. but, but thinking about it and then getting that feeling in the pit of your stomach, or for me it was like that where, well, if I was dead, I wouldn't be able to think and I wouldn't know that I was dead. And, and it was just kind of that like weird, like a bit, it was a bit of almost friction of like, ooh, that's weird to think about. Yeah. Um, and I think then being quite emotional when I was younger. And so that in and of itself, not by any means being, um, I don't know, uh, a precursor for, for mental ill health, but just recognizing that I felt things quite intensely. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember crying a lot. Really? <laughs> I kind of still okay. cry a lot. I cried when I watched the Lego movie, for example. <laughs> That's good. It's a great film. <laughs> <coughs> so, I mean, I, I've listened to your, your um, you t you've done two TEDx talks, basically, uh -huh. which were both absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed them. They're very, uh, your delivery is fantastic. And, and I'd quite like to ask you a few questions about that mm -hmm. um, as we go through the interview. Your story, y you speak about when you were 14 mm -hmm. um, and you were admitted uh, to a, you know, a psychiatric ward, essentially. I mean, tell me about what happened there and how it culminated in that. Mm, sort of, yeah, what precipitated it. Yeah. Um, right, well, my parents had never really had a sort of positive relationship in many ways or particularly my experience of it as a young person kind of really getting the feeling that, that your parents were having difficulties and maybe didn't love each other in, in a way that was mm. expressed or, or evident to you um, and eventually they made the decision to separate and, and get divorced um, which interestingly enough at the time I was quite happy about because I could tell my parents weren't happy together and I thought all right maybe um, them separating will will be will be a positive thing mm -hmm. um, but then equally within that, perhaps as, as a teenager, kind of getting a bit lost in that, in that my parents were going through some pretty profound emotional turmoil. And so my own maybe uh, mm. emotional state wasn't, wasn't held or supported as much. Um, so yeah, I think being in middle school as well, there's something about transitioning into a new space, mm -hmm. trying to learn about myself and maybe not having really great self-esteem okay. um, and really struggling to find my own identity and so feeling sort of displaced in many <laughs> many different elements of my life um but the actual process that led up to me being admitted was when my parents got divorced it wasn't amicable so in in the u.s um it kind of goes to the court system and there was a judge who noticed okay there's this 13 year old girl here um her parents are going through some difficult times maybe we should check in and see how she's doing mm -hmm. so it was a matter of being required actually to go start seeing a psychologist um as a part of this sort of uh sort of legal almost process okay. um and so then that kind of began my first interactions with uh being treated or seen by, by a counselor. Leading up to this, I think I was definitely suffering, but I was also quite good at masking it. So it wouldn't have maybe been particularly evident that I was um, experiencing difficulties. Um, but then pretty much went to try to see a couple different therapists. None of them really fit and then ended up in the local hospital in Greenwich, the Greenwich Hospital, and I spoke to a psychologist there for an hour. We had this conversation that culminated in, as you could have mentioned in the intro of me being labeled unsafe to self. So um, what was the conversation that you had with that person? It was a very like sort of, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced counseling, but when you kind of first are going to start seeing if you might work or fit or have a rapport with a counselor, mm -hmm. there's almost a bit of, getting your history, your background. So you kind of get asked questions about where you're at as an individual and 
I think particularly because I was a youth that was trying to say, okay, have you ever harmed yourself? Have you ever thought about suicide or taking your own life? Um, and yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I was in fact at the time self-harming and I okay. had had experiences of suicidal ideation. So thinking about taking my own life and that I think was enough for them to say, well, we're not, we're not safe or we're not comfortable for you to leave here. Interestingly, and this has kind of come in reflecting back on it because it was a hospital and in the United States we have um, a privatized healthcare system where there is lots of liability, we're very litigious, we're quick to say if you do something wrong I'll sue you. <laughs> um, I've postulated that because it, they're quite conservative as a hospital, they don't want to have seen me and me as a young person come in and express these things, leave, perhaps take my own life and them have the burden of responsibility. Okay. So I've kind of thought Mm, that might have been why it was so quick, like, all right, down to the emergency room, find you a bed in a local psychiatric ward and taken by ambulance there, because it was, it was that It sounds very dramatic. It was, actually, in <laughs> hindsight. It was pretty dramatic. I have this really funny memory of, um, I used to have loads of piercings, and I had this one really cool one, I have to say. Um, <laughs> it's called the triple helix, but I had one piece of jewelry, so it was three holes that I had a spiral in, um, and I'd gotten it put in pretty recently, and it, I, I liked it a lot. And they were like, well, you have to take that out because you're not allowed to bring it to the psychiatric mm. ward lest I, like, I don't know, take it out and do <laughs> something with it, which I, I, maybe I shouldn't laugh about. Um, but it was a bit ridiculous to me at the time, particularly as a 13-year-old or 14-year-old, sorry. Um, and uh, But then when I got there, they were like, oh, no, it's fine. You can have it. So then I was like, oh, <laughs> let's try to put this back in my ear. <laughs> oh, <that's> so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it actually like? What was the place like? What was the environment like? Okay, um, so it was called New York Presbyterian and in hindsight and speaking to other people, I think it was actually one of the better wards that was out there. Um, but it is actually a story I've crafted for my real talk work, but we haven't come to that yet. It was two hallways that intersected like an X and it was lined with doors where they had rooms and sort of areas for group work. Um, it was quite confined. We were, we were sort of locked in. I mean, I had that sort of thin gray carpet that you expect from, you know, sort of a clinical place with whitewashed walls. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there were about 30 maybe children that were in there, but all of us you know, how it was just this huge spectrum, this huge variety of diagnoses from kids that were sort of dealing with anger management, to eating disorders, to suicide attempts or bipolar or even drug addiction. And so it was just this kind of hodgepodge of children that were suffering. Yeah. And we were kind of just all shoved together <laughs> into, a, into a ward and said, all right, <laughs> you, should, uh, <laughs> really? you should try to get better. And I, I think I can look at it with humor now, because at the time it was pretty... Um, yeah. It was pretty traumatic because it really disrupted my, my view of myself. I think up until this point, I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. People that were surrounding me, my parents, my friends, my family, they didn't perceive that anything was, was happening with me. And then to be so explicitly labeled, you know, sort of in this case ma with major depressive disorder, but also it kind of felt like there is something wrong with you. We need yeah. to fix you because the treatment was very much mostly medication um, mm. the therapy that I experienced in there was very cursory and was just I guess in on a clinical level it was about stabilizing me so that I could get well enough to go out and then experience outpatient care um, but there wasn't like I've in speaking to people from the UK who've been admitted there seems to be better communication systems around treatment in that you're informed of what medication you're taking why you're taking it what side effects might be whereas in my case it was quite literally go up to it's called a Dutch door you know those doors where the top half swings back and there's someone standing behind it yeah. it's sort of like an yeah, yeah. orange is the new black where they like distribute <laughs> their <laughs> medication and stuff it was yeah. literally that where okay. someone handed me a cup of pills I had to take them open my mouth to you know kind of show in fact that I, that I was ingesting them um, without any explanation of, of why I was really doing those things. Yeah. Um, and then being a minor, not really having agency in it. It wasn't my choice. It wasn't my decision. I couldn't say actually, hold up, wait, <laughs> I want to leave. It was very yeah. much someone evaluating you and how well you're doing to say, okay, well, we'll sign off your, your admission. Do you, or do you your Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was. I was just going to say. I mean, in retrospect, do you feel as though that was the right course of action? Do you think you should have been there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, 
because I'm very much a proponent now of ev the idea that every experience I've, I've had has made me who I am. Of course. But when I do think back, I, I really don't think so mm -hmm. because when I met children that were there, and it's not it's not an act of comparison or being like, oh, I was like much better than they were. Cause it's not that. It was just recognizing that that that's maybe not where I was internally and that going to that space where you feel so excluded and so different, you have to normalize it. And I feel as though I learned actually a lot of techniques and tools there for lack of a better word. Like we were all just hang like days on end. I didn't, I went outside for, I think it was about an hour in the seven days that I was there. And, and so we're all kind of sitting there stewing together and exchanging, oh, well, you can't self-harm right now. If you get a hair tie and smack it across your wrist, like, you know, that will be something. Or if you hold ice, which actually ended up being a CBT exercise, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, I think I got a lot worse after coming out of there before getting better, but it's also hard mm. to say I definitely needed help. I'm not sure if that was the help I needed at that point, oh, yeah. but it's, it's always... Um, a really difficult decision to, to make in those contexts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was just kind of wondering, like, to what degree did you identify with the other people in there? But, you know, I suppose it's, it's all relative mm. and perhaps every single person there is of the view that, you know, I possibly shouldn't be here. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think everyone handles it differently. And I think yeah. in my own case, my own context, because it, it was so sudden, and it, was, it wasn't as though I had been treated previously or that, you know, I was really aware. I mean, I guess obviously it was self-harming, so there were things that, that weren't exactly right. But in my own mind, I was like, I'm handling this fine. No one knows. <laughs> I'm okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it was just quite jarring. Mm -hmm. And then dealing with the aftermath of that, you know, it's... Yeah. 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 What, what was your recovery process like? <laughs> I'm still in it. I'm still in it. Really? I mean, I, everyone has different thoughts about recovery and the recovery journey. And um, uh, for me, it's about just learning about myself and learning sort of coping mechanisms and, and triggers and getting to the bottom of, of my own past experiences and how they influence me now. Um, because I guess my recovery journey has been varied. It has been really difficult at times. I'd say particularly me as a high schooler was a very difficult time. Um, I think after coming out of, of the psychiatric ward and being so ashamed of where I'd been and the fact that I was now being medicated and getting to a point where I became extremely medicated and in that quite numb to everything and mm -hmm. being a teenager, being a young person, trying to develop and, and grow and learn about my space in the world, there's a lot of experimentation that's involved with it. And it's quite a dangerous thing, I think, to be getting into those those places in life without having the emotional literacy or even the ability to connect into my emotions to to get feedback sort of with myself about what I was doing. So, you know, just yeah. kind of, <laughs> I wouldn't say went off the deep end of it because I'm not sure that's the right turn of phrase, but um, I definitely uh, reached every corner of my label, shall we say. When they had the tick, spot, tick block exercises, I was like, fine, I'll show it to you. You tell me I'm this, I'll do it. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think, yeah, that was, that was a very difficult time in my life of, of being a high schooler. And then since then coming out um, of high school and, and going into university and my professional life and even in my personal life, uh, it's been challenging. I think I'm just now at a, pla a place in life where I'm feeling maybe the most comfortable and aware and tuned in and um, proactive in mm -hmm. my own mental health. So I think that is a good thing. That's a really positive of thing. Course. And so our recovery journey has gotten to a place of, of positive energy and trajectory. Yeah. But it, um, you know, it always has its, its ups and its downs. So of course. it's never consistent. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. What has been the... Um, the kind of process in educating yourself. Y you spoke a bit about, you know, you didn't necessarily have the language when you were younger, mm -hmm. or even, I suppose, when you're young, you m might not necessarily have the comprehension. Mm -hmm. So what has been your, uh, yeah, like your kind of self-education in that? Hmm. Well, that's, that's just, a r it's so complex and there's so many things that, that tie into it. Um, from a young age, I've been a very avid reader. Okay. And so sometimes I wonder, I mean, there's, there's a lot of research done around how 
reading at a young age helps build empathy because you're able to connect him with characters and experience things that maybe you haven't experienced. Mm. Um, and sometimes I wonder like, wow, is that why I feel things so intensely or um, why I feel like I can really resonate and understand other people and experiences or I don't know. Um, mm. But um, Yes, reading so was obviously Yeah, so reading, so how have I sell it? Yes, yeah, yeah no, it's fine. <laughs> um, well, when I left the psychiatric ward, I was in an outpatient care. So I spent about four years in, uh, in therapy in the US, maybe more. And that was very interesting because I was doing predominantly CBT, which in hindsight I think about, and you don't tend to do CBT for that long, it's normally quite a short intervention and it's about changing negative thought processes and okay. patterns and, and recognizing sort of unhealthy uh, coping mechanisms. I think that encouraged or demanded of me a very analytical mindset of needing to recognize certain actions I was taking or certain things I was doing and then going f a bit back and, and analyzing, okay, well, what thought process is, is sort of propagating that and then saying, okay, well, how can I change that thought process or be mindful of it and so I can recognize and maybe cope in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, yeah, that's always looking back, you know, you kind of can connect all the dots. Absolutely. Um, at the time, I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think putting myself in new in situations, challenging myself where I, I actually had to um, uh, experience tension within myself or, or mm, be confronted with, with certain elements of myself has been really good in learning. So just being in challenging situations, I think, at least personally, is a really good way to, to learn about how you deal and cope and gives you space to reflect and maybe change certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and more recently, I think, connecting into my own creativity and, and expression and mm. in, in whether it's dancing or rolling around on the ground and laughing with your friends <laughs> or uh, storytelling, Still reading um, yeah. music, yeah, I don't know. Nice, good stuff. How did you end up in Edinburgh? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, again, as with life, there's always <laughs> a complexity. There's never like a singular objective viewpoint to something, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in one, on one part, I, I traveled abroad for the first time when I was 13 and had been completely astounded by the fact that there was such a vast and diverse world out there that, that before that I hadn't really, really known about. And so I think there was a motivation from that to want to, to maybe go abroad for university so I could immerse myself in other cultures. But then I think I was partially running away and partially kind of wanting to uh, stick it to the US education system a bit because I had grown up in a very achievement oriented and super intense college focused atmosphere where it's like if you hadn't applied to 15 you know, like colleges early application I mean you can only apply to one of the application but um mm -hmm. you know it was very competitive and very intense but it didn't resonate with me it didn't feel right particularly being in the mindset I, I was at where I wasn't even sure I wanted to still be alive let alone mm. try to dictate the next four years of my life and try to have to prove myself in what I felt to be a very arbitrary way, which is like, how good are your SAT scores? And like, what does your CV look like? Yeah. Um, so I think Edinburgh for me represented like being really removed from the US education system. Um, and then yeah, also running away. If I think I wasn't able to cope as well with the space that I'd grown up with and come to terms yet with how my, my experiences growing up had impacted me. So I, I thought maybe if I just get out of here and I get away, mm -hmm. um, I'd been in at the time right before I went to university in a really unhealthy relationship as well. So I think it was kind of this idea, okay, well I can escape, go somewhere else and really find myself. Yeah. Um, ironically, you can't run from yourself, but that being <laughs> said, I love Edinburgh. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it was really good. Yeah. <laughs> What are some of the ways, uh, in a sort of cultural sense, in which Edinburgh differs from the US? Ooh, so many, so many little <laughs> ways. I think I, I was naive when I came and I was like, they speak English, like, it'll be fine. It'll all be the same. But then it's like things like you say trousers instead of pants. And if you say you weren't wearing pants today, everyone's kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> too much information. Um, yeah, a lot of it's in colloquialisms and lexicon and the way people speak. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then yeah i mean there's all there's all sorts of different cultural things i mean obviously the drinking age is quite different in the us and in the uk and that yeah. really affects the drinking culture and then drinking culture affects people's well-being um i think hi the history of edinburgh and the history of pretty much most other places other than the US, because the US is such a young nation comparably to so many other spaces, mm -hmm. um, to come to a place that's been steeped in so much history. I mean, even you think of Edinburgh and, and sort of being the sort of bastion of enlightenment and, and so many ideas and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, going to a building that's older than sort of the US, older than the nation I came from, and there's a Tesco <laughs> in it, it's the market, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like, hmm, bit of perspective. Um, so yeah, I don't and, and and sort of many ways that are hard sometimes to actually fully articulate. It's just it's a feeling you kind of get. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Also, British like politeness and reservedness. Being American, obviously, I'm very verbose and, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and a, a bit sort of rambunctious in, in a certain <laughs> way. Whereas you know, sort of the, the oh, I can't believe I forgot this. Cues, cueing, lines. I now have become very British in that way. When I go back to the US, it is a general free-for-all. Like, you think there's a line, it's not. It's everyone crowd around something and push your way through. <laughs> and then here, people are like, will queue to, like, I don't even know, to like check out for their groceries. And they're like, back to you. And so it's lovely, it's super polite <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, civilized. And I, and I enjoy it. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a really, uh, yeah, it's a good observation. I like that one. Awesome. I think that's pretty standard. Awesome. Or maybe if it is, if you've, if you've been yeah. to different places yeah, <laughs> if you've been yeah. to the US and you're like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, tell me about uh, Real Talk. You know, how, how did the idea for this initially come about? Hmm. Um, well, I think you had you had mentioned earlier that I've I'd participated with uh, with TEDx, University of Edinburgh, and given given a talk and with them, and that was my second year of university, and that got to a point where I think I, I just sort of recognized that I didn't want to be hiding a piece of myself anymore because, you know, going back then to that question about the recovery journey, throughout the whole time before I came to Edinburgh, my own mental health was very much a, a very intimate struggle for me. It was what I spoke about with my very close friends and family, and that was really it. Your, you know, your opening line to people isn't something like, "Hey, how are you? I've been to a psychiatric ward. What about yourself?" Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so, but that can also be quite harmful because there's a lot of shame and stigma that comes in then if you have an experience you have a piece of yourself that you can't share for for fear of being treated differently or of being yeah. told you're crazy or of being maligned but um i think there was a a process for the student speakers with tedx that we went through where it was to help us hone on what our idea might be to give this talk and for me it became clear that my expertise was in my lived experience. And so I, I gave this talk and I ended up speaking in front of 500 people and being like, here's what I've been through. Um, and whilst that was a very empowering and cathartic process to, to have done it, it was the actual process of crafting my story and speaking about it with people that is where it sort of catalyzed this idea for Real Talk because I might be at a party and someone would say, oh, what are you getting up to? Or, you know, kind of kind of classic chat, getting to know you. And I'd mention I was doing TEDx. Oh, amazing. What are you speaking about? My experience with mental ill health. Oh, no way. My mom or my friend or this person I know or I've, I'm curious about it. it. It just, as soon as I was honest, it sparked the ability for people to respond and that it was this permission to say, wow, I can speak about this here with you. Maybe it helped that we were at a party drinking. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do it in other environments as well. <laughs> and um, uh, I just recognized we needed more spaces mm. to speak openly about mental health. I wanted to pair the public speaking element, the performative element of actually sharing stories with the support process that speakers could go through um, because because Real Talk is a mental health storytelling organization. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of this two prong, this multifaceted sort of process of we're empowering people who've experienced mental ill health to learn how to share their story. And then in sharing their story, they're empowering the people listening to become more empathetic, to be more compassionate and to give them permission to have a conversation about what in our society is a very you know, difficult topic still to speak about. It's in many ways some of the final frontiers of, of you know, kind of what we're being, we're able to speak comfortably about in our society. Um, so I think, yeah, yeah it, was, it was from my own personal experience that I sort of had this idea to, 
to just run some storytelling workshops in an yeah, event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so how does it work? What's the format? Sure. So the first one I ever ran, I approached um, a professional storyteller and lecturer at the University of Edinburgh named Let Willis. I said, hey, I have this idea. I want to get people to share their mental health stories, but I don't want them to be unsupported. Let's craft a process. And what that turned out to be was two workshops. They're about two and a half hours each that went through the basics of story, oral storytelling and story crafting. So story archetypes, elements of performance, gesture, voice control. Um, and after these two workshops, it would then culminate our journey together in a performance where the stories that people had made, they'd be able to share to an intimate audience um, and then Throughout that process, it was quite iterative. Then I kind of thought, okay, well, actually, maybe in the performance itself, we'll have like a Q and A, and we'll get the the audience speaking with each other and with the speakers, um, and it's just kind of blossomed from there. It's pretty much that two workshops um, culminating in a performance, and it happens in about the process of the space of three weeks. So it's pretty uh, it's pretty quick. It's pretty rapid fire. Yeah. But that's I think in hindsight, it wasn't intentional, but quite positive because it doesn't give people time to overthink <laughs> and get all like wrapped up in oh what am I saying like what are the semantics of this um, so yeah at the moment real talk is these workshops that then lead to a community-based event but um we're just working on all sorts of fun and sort of not auxiliary but just different um models of or different uh, sort of activities we want to start doing fantastic good stuff <clears throat> Storytelling. This is a word that is, for me, is starting to <laughs> pop up quite a lot, especially in, I suppose, social media and in uh, kind of videography. You mm. know, it's a lot about storytelling. What does storytelling mean to you? Hmm. I think storytelling is our humanity. It is one of the oldest things that we do as a species. I mean, in my belief, and I think if you think about it a bit sort of logically, like everything we know and understand is a story, whether it's our economic systems, our religious beliefs, it just happens to be that they're stories we put a lot of value <laughs> and sort of live yeah. our lives by. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then equally as individuals, I think we all have stories. So I think for me, storytelling is, is just about sharing experience. It's about sharing wisdom and um, it's about fostering empathy and connection because I mean you're, you're exactly right storytelling is kind of the zeitgeist like if you want to sort of be cool you gotta say storytelling um, and so <laughs> I do sometimes recognize the irony in that <laughs> in real talk but um but I think that's because particularly then in the context of sort of PR advertising because we've we've moved away from the utility of products we don't just want to say I like this product because it does things efficiently and well we want to connect and we want to feel like mm -hmm. you know I want to I want to buy this product because it's going to fit into my understanding of myself. Um, so, so I think storytelling is sort of, it's just a really wonderful, powerful thing that has broad application, but at the end of the day is about connecting into our humanity and, and into our connection with the world around us. That's an awesome answer. I love the way that you, cr you craft sentences. <laughs> you, they, just, you, they just roll off your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the vision for real talk you know where do you see it in five years oh interesting yeah because like okay, at first my mind goes to like vision statement but then that's not exactly like sort of five year trajectory because i think at its core real talk is is just trying to reduce mental health stigma to promote authenticity around experiences of mental ill health mm. is what you'd find sort of written <laughs> on the website or something. <laughs> um, but in five years, I mean, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm really bad for, for like meticulous planning. I definitely have desires of where I want to go. I mean, I'd love to see real talk happening. I mean, internationally, I'd love to be able to replicate th this sort of process and then bring it other places. So I'm starting to run Real Talks in Glasgow, even though we first did it in Edinburgh, and then I'm going to go up to Dundee. Um, and who knows, then maybe there's a sort of licensing or um, social franchising model that might be able to bring it even further. Mm. But that's just within that Real Talk sort of impact model that I've already aligned upon. I'd also love to develop the other activities Real Talk does to, to promote mental well-being and to promote reducing mental health stigma. I've had ideas of trying to develop a self-care almost training course about curating sort of 
what different self care self care tools there are out there, and and giving people space to to experiment, to try them, to pick them up, put them back down if they don't like them, or to to hold them and put them in their sort of toolbox of of recovery support um, if they like it, um, and also running more community based events around just more information about experiences of mental ill health, whether it's diagnosis specific or whether it's about what is the process like of finding a therapist. So. Um, mm. Yeah, in five years, I think I'd just love to see Real Talk still happening in its sort of workshop event model, but also to have seen it grow and develop and, and connect even more with the community and also learn what people want. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you know what my ideas are. I mean, those are useful, but I also want to know what ideas people would like to, to see reflected in their, in their society. Yeah, yeah, great. This is, I've got a question down here that's... It's, intentionally broad but I'm, mm. I'm not sure where to even start with it um, what are your views on mental health today <laughs> yeah, yeah. what are my views on mental health today well in many ways there it, it's really positive because I think just purely by nature of, of being alive in the era that we're in is we have some of the most progressive sort of treatment or the most awareness, or maybe that's not true. In our current society, I think we're just getting to a place that we're starting to, to recognize that mental ill health and mental illness and mental, yeah, just mental well-being is so important. And it's, we're just getting the, the sort of the cogs turning and starting to get conversations going and trying to make sure people are getting appropriate treatment. Mm -hmm. um, even to the point where I think, you know, a few years Previous to this, Real Talk might not even be as successful as it's been so far, just because as a society now, we're more willing to talk about it. But equally, I think there's still such a long way to go. I mean, when you think about mental health treatment sort of systemically and the way sort of clinical approaches to mental health have been developing and um, the way we're trying to reconcile early sort of pioneering research into sort of whether it's psychoanalysis or even neuroscience, we're, we're kind of trying now to to be more, more agile, I think, maybe, with the way we think about mental health, because um, it's, it's been quite siloed, you know, it's sort of this physical health, mental health separation, and, and it's so impossible to remove a part of yourself from you, your brain, from your body. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm really hoping that we start to, on one end, almost scientifically and academically, recognize the complexity of, of being human, but then um, on a social level, also start to allow ourselves to break free from these really strict concepts of self that we've kind of promoted as a society, this really sort of linear path to achievement or path to success hmm. or path to personal enlightenment because um, it's hard, it's hard to live and it's hard to, um, to find your way. And I'd really love for us to start honoring the journey that we all have to take to, um, to becoming well. Yeah. So, yeah. Mental health today. I don't know if that really answers it. Yeah, no, uh, it's it's it's, it's a re really interesting one. I mean, I think that this in in young people, I think there is well, I think technology. Um, oh, yeah. There was a quote that I read the other night, and I think it was by uh, Thomas Sowell, who's like a well-known uh, economist, mm. kind of. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you would call him. Um, he's very sort of right-wing in his views, very capitalist, mm. and it was the fact that. Uh, it, the idea was basically that technology has uh, gone beyond humanity, basically. Hmm. Um, and the way in which, I mean, you know, like mobile phones and technology as a whole, is it actually detrimental to people's mental health? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a huge thing around technology um, that I intentionally at the moment almost... Uh, skirt around with real talk and that a lot of people have said to me why don't you film the talks and why don't you put them up on you know have this repository online mm. which in many ways is, is alluring but then equally I'm such a huge proponent of um, physical space of being in a room with someone and seeing them and hearing them and and connecting on that sort of really deeply energetic level that I think sometimes can be lost through technology, because mm, um, mm. there is this sort of lens or this shroud that then separates you from another person. Um, but don't get me wrong, I think there are a, n a number of great resources and tools that exist online and or exist through technology. Um, I just recognize as well, on a more 
sort of business level that you know I kind of I found sort of more, more of my segmentation and so I'll let other people at the moment deal with the technological side and I'll try to harken back to some of the more physical space yeah. um because yeah yeah it's it's uh it's just a complex world. <laughs> it really is, yeah, yeah. No, you did well to answer that, given that it wasn't really a question, so good effort. <laughs> um, <More> commentary. <laughs> what, what did you learn from doing TED Talks? Mm. What did that experience give you? Hmm. I think it gave me a community. Um, it was a process that I went through alongside other people, particularly the student speaker process, um, which is sort of unique, or maybe not wholly unique, but the the way in which TEDx University at of Edinburgh has set up their process is that they have this space for student speakers to actually receive training. Um, so that was useful to just get my head around what I, what might be so important for me to speak up because I remember the first time I ever heard about TED Talks. It was from a teacher of mine, Mr. C, and he showed our entire AP Biology class. He was like, guys, check this website out. And I did, and I was like, whoa, maybe one day, one day in the future, <laughs> I'll, I'll give a TED Talk. That would be amazing. Um, and I would have, if you had told me that, you know, in whatever, six, seven years time that I'd have the opportunity, I would have been like, that's ridiculous. I have no expertise at that age. Um, <laughs> so I guess there's an element of empowerment and saying, wow, I do have something valuable to say. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it, it just held the space for me to be able to, um, recognize speaking about mental health and mm -hmm. mental health advocacy was so important to me because it's it's catalyzed then in its stead so many um, thi so many things I could not never have predicted that I would have been doing I mean I'm doing my storytelling apprenticeship now I'm studying now to become a counselor and that's all come out of real talk which is in many ways come out from my experience with with TEDx so um, yeah it's sort of that Domino exactly. branching, yeah, sort of yeah. nebulous future thing. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what speaking advice would you give to someone who was preparing to do a, a TED talk? Hmm. Well, I think doing research um, about public speaking would would be useful, and doing making sure you're comfortable with with the topic you want to speak about. Speak about what you know. Um, in a weird way, take more pauses. Um, speak more slowly than you think you need to because there's it definitely when you're on a stage and the spotlight's on you and people are staring at you if you take a second you think it's a lifetime but actually everyone's like oh I'm just processing what you're saying um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> great um, <laughs> oh you're thinking you're very pensive no, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah um because yeah on a public speaking level I think yeah to to, to prepare, to practice with people, to put it out there. It's so iterative and, and to get feedback because um, I told so many random people my, my, my sort of talk, my story um, in various ways. It wasn't I necessarily like sort of declaimed it to them, you know, for 15 minutes, but you know, I'd, I'd, I'd try bits and pieces and see how people responded. And then I was able to kind of work that into a sort of greater Narrative. To be fair, I was also quite comfortable with public speaking to begin with. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, lucky on that. <laughs> yeah, you don't ap appear to suffer badly at all from the sort of nerves or anxiety of speaking in front of people. Hmm. I think I did acting class when I was about uh, eight or nine. Okay. Um, and a secret, like, sort of desire of mine is to be an actress, but that was. That was more, I think, yeah, when I was younger. I mean, even still now, I, quite, I just don't necessarily find myself <laughs> in that space. Yeah. Um, but I guess that with storytelling, there's very much a, a performance element. So it's interesting to see now how I think I'm being a lot more authentic in my expression. I'm connecting into things that I w was like, oh, wow, blue sky thinking when I was younger, but recognizing actually I can, I can weave those into how I live my life and, and what I do. Um, but yes, so... I have a very, um, I have a father as well who has the gift of gab. So I think okay. I've had someone who was very much able to kind of just respond and, and really quickly formulate things. Maybe call it bullshit, maybe call it kind of <laughs> really good at, at being able to speak. So sometimes I'm not even sure where I stand with it. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I've got some questions for you that go a little deeper, you know, kind of bigger philosophical type stuff. Mm. Uh, which, yeah, I always enjoy these. 
First one, what is your purpose in life? <laughs> what is my purpose? Um, in many ways, it's just to exist and to take things as they come on a biological type of <laughs> level. <laughs> kind of think of it of like, well, I just need to learn about my environment and respond to stimuli. Um, but then I think, I think my purpose is to witness people. Um, I think I've always loved connecting into how I feel and to being there to support other people and, and really hashing out these complexities that we've, we've spoken of, of, of the challenges of, of being alive and of trying to reconcile our belief belief systems with the way that the world presents itself. So I think um, there's a purpose in, in just trying to connect in with people that I meet um, and trying to keep on keeping on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it maybe isn't as profound or uh, <laughs> I don't know, as grand as I might have hoped it would have come out. <laughs> as, but, <laughs> I guess there's a, there's a there's a grace to uh, to simplicity as well. So <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think you would like your legacy to be? <laughs> Ooh, you know I read over these questions before <laughs> before I came here, but I really didn't do myself justice in preparing. Um, what I like my legacy to be: um, being kind and helping people. I think. Um, yeah, I'd like to say make a difference as well, but I think that you know that that's pretty pretty broad and and esoteric. But because I think I think the beauty in that though is that making a difference can be that one conversation you had with that one person you met on the tube in London when you were traveling there for five seconds, and actually that that word you said or that that, that phrase has stuck with them, or it's maybe who knows inspire some great societal shift in the way we <laughs> conceptualize mental health. Um, <laughs> you know, who am I to say? But I think at the end of the day, um, yeah, to, to disrupt things and, and get disrupt. people to think differently. Yeah, nice. What are you most grateful for in life? Hmm, being alive. Yeah. Being alive and for my friends and family that and even strangers that I that I meet and and have incredible conversations with, and that rejuvenate and remind me that we're all just trying to trying to make it through. Hmm. If you could master any skill or habit, what would it be? <laughs> it would be learning Hungarian. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> which has been from a very young age. Um, so my my family on my mom's side is Hungarian. My my grandparents were Hungarian refugees. Oh, wow. Um, and my mom and her sisters all speak Hungarian. And unfortunately, mom never taught me. Why, mom, why? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she just used this wine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I grew up listening to Hungarian and being like, wow, I want to speak this. And then never learning. I've, I've since, I, I went to Budapest for a month in my second year of university th during the summer to, to take an intensive language course. And so I have a very limited sort of very wee grasp of it because it's really freaking hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of thing. When I hear people speaking Hungarian in the street, I can I know it's Hungarian, and I can't wait for the day I can turn around and be like, "Hey, how you doing?" Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm going to. Um. So that is the that is the skill I'm going to master, which will probably involve moving there. So we'll see when that unfolds in my okay. life. Okay. Yeah. I can understand why you'd want to do that now, but when you said it, I was like, "What?" Yeah. No, it's not <laughs> just like I just really want to learn a hard language. Yeah. I could learn so many more useful <laughs> languages. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll learn some of those too. But um. Yeah, it's, it's a really an identity thing for me. So. Mm -hmm. hmm. How do you define success? What does success look like for mm. you? I think it's correlated to me with fulfillment. So I think success for me will be like when I'm, when I'm doing something that's sort of making an impact and that is, um, that is also allowing me to grow and develop. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's as much about you know that I'm gonna make loads of money and start an empire, um, which you know it might be cool, but that I think that's not w where my my motivation comes from. Because for me, being being successful will be 
would be it. it's going back to my purpose is knowing I've made a difference in that that is sort of fulfillment and feeling as though I'm living really really authentically and um, not apologizing for what I want to achieve instead of maybe feeding into a narrative of achievement or success that isn't mine which is really challenging I think societally we have quite a yeah. you know a sort of fixed idea of what it is to be successful um, and yeah I want to be able to support myself but I also want to know that I'm doing something that's meaningful for me. Are you successful now? <laughs> <sighs> yes I am but it's really hard sometimes to allow yourself to recognize that because there is always that either self-esteem or voice in your head that's like you could be doing better you could be doing more you could be making more money you could be I don't know <laughs> changing even more lives no um I think yes I am and that's the personal work I need to do in learning how to um sink into that and and appreciate where I am yeah yeah mm. I don't want to put words into your mouth but the fact that you're still here on the planet presumably yeah. is a success right <laughs> yeah it really is it really is um I think yeah, I touched upon it like with the the gratitude for um, yeah, for being alive. So, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and who or what inspires you? Hmm. Humans. It all comes out. I'm really like, ooh. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love I love animals as well, um, <laughs> which I didn't touch upon. I used to want to be a veterinarian, um, which is partially why I found out about Edinburgh University. But uh, I digress. Um, yeah. The incredible people that I've met in the world and the people that I found myself surrounded with now in Edinburgh, even at home, um, are incredible. Our inspirations, just seeing people find out what's important to them and achieve the goals that they've set for themselves, regardless of you know whether those are my goals or not. I don't care. It's because you see someone find themselves, and that's that's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, thinking of all the people that have come before you that have done incredible things and, and the fact that this world's gotten to a place where I'm able to, to occupy the space that I do um, is, is really cool. Um, so yeah, I think, I think witnessing other people is, is really um, inspirational. Um, less of a specific person, but more <laughs> yeah, <laughs> appreciation yeah. of, of people in general. Definitely. Mm. Before we started uh, recording, we were you mentioned that you had life goals that are completely kind of unrelated to one another in a, suppose, a lateral sense. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of your life, <laughs> what are some of your life goals? Uh, I have a whole list. So um, <laughs> let's see. First one, probably predominantly, is learn Hungarian. Um, I'd really like to work with cheetahs. That's why I wanted to be a veterinarian but then changed that to wildlife conservation and I studied ecological and environmental sciences at uni. Um, so I still hope in a roundabout way that I'll get to that. Why um, cheetahs? I just really love them. You know, it's, <laughs> there's something about them as a, as a creature that's so fascinating. This sort of, they, ha they live quite sort of solitary existences, but then they do come together at very specific times in order to procreate. And um, and the way in which they live in their environment, they have this huge exertion in order to catch their prey. And then, man, if they don't, if they're unsuccessful, it's really, that it's really tough for them because they've just like ran super freaking fast in order to catch the antelope and they don't do it. Then how are they going to feed little babies and how are they going to live? Um, and they're <laughs> just beautiful. And I love cats and I love big cats. Um, and yeah, I don't know, for some reason, it's just one of those things that I, I can't really explain it. Yeah, Maybe. it was just because I was just fascinated by this, this sort of specificness of cheetahs. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a cat it's person. Cats, <laughs> I'm definitely a cat person, but I tend to group cats as cats. <laughs> oh, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, okay. species, they're very separate. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. very, but you know, there's a little separation. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote this whole article, uh, article, not article, uh, essay um, about cheetahs my first year when I got really into it. It was really cool. They've been yeah. through a really serious um, genetic bottleneck because they experienced as a species like either oh, some really big sort of disease or something. So they're all quite genetically similar. So cheetahs are actually really susceptible um, potentially to like, uh, not necessarily the environment, but to disease. So if there was to be like, I don't know, some crazy cheetah flu that went around like that, that could be really oh decimate their population i mean they're already they're already pretty pretty 
be in trouble, sort of just more about habitat conservation. But um, yeah. yeah, I want to uh, dance professionally. I'd love to do either sort of a partner, probably swing dancing, I like swing dancing, um, and compete. Maybe not, I'm not sure professionally is the right word, but either compete dancing. Um, cool. I'd like to make an album. <laughs> an album? <laughs> yes, I play flute and I sing. I'm not sure if I need the flute on the album, but I'd like to like collab with some amazing musicians and try to create some music. Nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. There are all sorts of random things that are on my list of, of stuff to do. Um, <laughs> so that's... Cool stuff, though. Yeah. I like it. Exciting yet terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Hmm. You know, I, I kind of thought in getting to this question that something would just pop up in my mind of like, that's it, that's the piece of advice. Um, but I think there's something to, I guess the, I don't know if it's treat other people how you want to be treated, the kind of golden mm -hmm. rule type thing, but something around just bringing non-judgment to the people that you meet because you're never sure what people have been through or what experiences they've, they've had that brought them where they are mm -hmm. um, and maybe influence why they act or comport themselves in a certain way. And so I think trying to um, just accept people as they are, and that's not necessarily a piece of advice someone's explicitly maybe given to me, but it's kind of weaving together a lot of the sort of life lessons that I've learned perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would normally ask if you could speak to your 20 year old self, what would you say? Um, but there's probably not as much value in that. So I'm going to ask you if you could speak to your 14 year old self, what would you say? Ah, you are enough. You're okay. And <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you are enough. You're enough. Mm. Still trying to... Uh, embody that one but uh yeah <laughs> i think particularly you just you know you just give her a hug and be like man i love you <laughs> so i think yeah that would be it <laughs> if you could change anything in the world what would it be and why oh man there's just so many wow um i'm trying to think of like the most well, tell, encompassing one. Tell me what you're thinking. What was the first thing that came to your mind? Well, I mean, obviously, my, my, my mind jumps to sort of like stigma and discrimination and wanting to, you know, sort of minimize that. And then you start thinking of sort of, a, of, of oppression and, and of power dynamics because it exists on so many different levels in so many ways for so many people. It's just like, I wish we could just like, I don't know, snap my fingers and then all of a sudden everyone just had this really sort of deep empathy capacity and active listening ability where then you know we were able to sort of i don't know <laughs> it sounds really like utopian and naive like live harmoniously and like not have conflict um i guess it, on the level of, of where we're not like harming other people because obviously mm -hmm. we kind of we need to have dissonance and disagreement to learn and to progress but i think i would love to not have to see people really, you know, suffering at many, at, at many times because of the way that our society is designed and set up. So yeah, I don't have the solution, but I have the dream. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good answer. It's, it reminded me because um, a previous guest, Selby Carey, mm. spoke about empathy he actually what he basically said was the ability to hear one another's thoughts because then there would be no lying and there'd be greater empathy and i think part of the inspiration for oh his man. answer yeah that's a bit scary though Sorry. <laughs> a little <laughs> bit a little I, bit i, I know selfie is my hall's <laughs> first year so yeah. no offense but i'm like oh god I don't want people to know what i'm thinking yeah it's I, I think part of the inspiration for his answer and he used he referenced this in another one of his answers is a uh, show on Netflix called Sense8. Mm. And a Sense8 is someone that can, uh, yeah, sort of feel other people's emotions or really connect and understand with it. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's a great answer, well, definitely. And it would reduce the amount of suffering and pain in, in mm. the world that we have, for sure. So yeah, something around that, that, that yeah. empathy. Yeah, yeah, mm. totally. Cool. 
Yeah. Lily, I've yeah. had a wonderful time speaking with you. Oh, um, amazing. You know, it's, listening to some of your answers have been really pretty staggeringly awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a, a real joy spending time with you. It's been really great to you, be able to blather. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for yeah. listening and for it, having me here. It's an absolute pleasure. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And, I uh, really did. hope I did you justice. Yeah. Thanks for, for challenging me in the way I think about things in <laughs> yeah. a certain way. I, I, I like to see it in that yes. way. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Lily, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Elliot. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.